Ja, ich glaube, wir sind schon auf Leitung. Good afternoon, hello and welcome. My name is Marion Kresge. I'm the director of the Heinrich Böll Office in Sarajevo. Welcome to the History Forum 2020, an event with tradition for a couple of years organized in cooperation with Memorial from Moscow. This year in a digital format, this is for you and for us for sure kind of a premiere. For all of you who did not attend our first um, panel in the uh, afternoon today, we would like to give you now some background information about technical support and procedures. For our panel, we are offering today three official languages, English, German, and Russian. You can go to the Zoom taskbar at the bottom where you find, find the button interpretations. There is a small globe. Then you can choose your channel for the language you would like to listen to. Our topic today, experiences of violence between commemoration and tabuization. And before we will get a deeper insight um, into the topic and introduce our guests, I give the floor right now to Irina Sherbakova, the other moderator. We are a team here today sitting in Moscow. Irina, the floor is yours. Yeah. Dankeschön. Ich begrüße jetzt alle Teilnehmer auf Deutsch. Und Thank you very much. I would now like to welcome all the participants in German and we will continue with our work. I hope that you also joined us the, the previous hour because the discussion actually will be resumed and continued. And as Marion has already mentioned in English, we will talk about um, violence, experiences of violence, And I think everything that Marlon has said was easy to understand, but you can find the, the interpretation button, it's at the bottom. And you can see this globe there in the taskbar at the bottom. And there you can listen to our discussion in three different languages. Now, I would like to briefly introduce two of the panelists and I'm delighted to do so because these panelists are Marta Arunishko, she's a historian, has a PhD in history and is a scientific assistant at the Institute of Contemporary History at the National Academy of Sciences in Ukraine. And right now, uh, welcome to you, Marta. She's a research fellow at the Holocaust Memorial Museum in the United States. And she's also the author of a book and has published different articles about violence and gender-based violence in the Second World War, about gender, feminism. So I'm quite delighted that Marta is here with us from the United States. AIDS, I guess. And as the next panelist, I would like to welcome Aida Fabikian. I hope that she can hear us. She's a researcher in the South Caucasian Office of the Heidi Bo Foundation in Yerevan in Armenia. She participated in different projects, and now I can see Aida. with human rights uh, topics or history topics. And she also conducted research on the Second World War and the role of women and women as victims of political repression in the South Caucasus region uh, in the, at the time of the Soviets. So Aida, welcome to you. And I'm quite happy and I'm about you joining us, and I'm looking forward to your discussion, and now I would like to pass the floor to Marion. Thank you very much, Irina. Now we come to the next two panelists. I'm quite happy to introduce Hubert Sommer. He's a freelance historian and cultural scientist, and he cooperates with the University of Chicago or also the Memorial of Ravensbrück. And for many years, he has done research in a topic that is not so widely known. It is about camp brothels in the concentration camps. And we will soon talk about this topic together with him. So uh, I'm glad that you could join us here, Robert. Welcome to you. And our fourth guest, last but not least, 
is Adela Yusech, whom I'd like to welcome from Sarajevo. She's an artist, she's an uh, activist and feminist, and she will also focus on a very important topic, women and the partisan movement. We already touched upon this topic in the first panel, so every movement that organized the resistance in, uh, against the uh, National Socialist regime and their collaborators um, also um, had women in the ranks. And I'm quite hopeful that Adela is already here. Adela, welcome to you. Thank and the topic of, hello, welcome. Um, our topic is women in the Second World War. So this is a perspective which is uh, marginalized in today's history. And we are the more pleased that we can focus on this perspective today with you, with our guests. In this forum, we will not that much talk about what has taken place in detail. So what were the historic events that uh, took place? But uh, we would like to talk about the memories, how it is being remembered or also um, being tabooed. So we have four very interesting guests that we invited and we are quite happy. We will see a little movie by Adela Yusic. Thank you. Just a second to share my screen. Usually it takes a little moment, uh, however, so far everything has worked out uh, nicely today from a technical point of view. Um, okay, now everything is supposed to work and... Okay, I'm about to play now.
Ona je vjerovala da će, kad rad bude gotov, žene ravnopravno odlučivati o pitanjima društvenog života. Ona je vjerovala da će, kad rad bude gotov, žene imati podjedna kuti u vladi. Ona je vjerovala da će, kad rad bude gotov, žene biti nagrađene za svoje zastupke. Ona je vjerovala da će njena borba izbojevati slobodu iza žene. Ona je vjerovala da je drugarica svoje drugostima. Ona je vjerovala da je bratko jedinstvo, jedinstvo ne samo braće, već i sestara. Ona nije znala da borba protiv fašizma neće biti gotova nakon borbe protiv fašizma. U fizičkoj znazi i držljivosti i muškarac je nije ravan. Sve zadatke izvršavala je sa puno volje i zalaganje. Važila je kao najrevolucionarnija omladinka svoje grupe. Od svoje crvene suknje od svile, koju je samo jedan put obukla, napravila je zastavu na kojoj je žutim koncem izvjetla Srb, Čekić, Petokrapu. Kada se jedan put pre štabu našla kao kuharica, osjećao se ubriđeno. Smrtno je ranjena prilikom izvlačenja ranjenog druga. Na nosilima, na putu do bolice, pjevala je borbeni pjez. Više nije na svom postamentu. Na njenom grobu ne piše njeno ime. Na njenom grobu piše nepoznata partizanka. Ok, now you hear me? So, I stopped sharing the screen, right? I don't hear you. Danke schön, danke schön. Uh, thank you so much. Um, genau, das war auf dem Grabstein, Nepoznata Partizanka. Yes, uh, we could uh, see that this was an unknown partisan woman that was engraved on the tombstone. Just a short question, where does this tombstone can be found and why did you record this, this film? Well, basically, yeah, just in, in, in a few sentences, after the World War II in Yugoslavia, partisans whose names were not known, were buried, buried under the gravestones that instead of a name had words like unknown partisan or unknown partisan women. Uh, and in 2017, for the 8th of March, I created the replica of such gravestone with the words unknown partisan women, and we put it in a park in the center of Sarajevo near other historically important sites, such as a place where Franz Ferdinand was killed, the city hall, which was burned in the recent war, and across the building where notorious jail was where many women anti-fascists and men were held prisoners and tortured during the war. And until today, three years after, no city authorities or media gave attention to the gravestone. It is still on the same spot. 
So video consists of documentation of this illegal action and audio consists of narration of text written by me and based on stories about lives of Second World War heroines from Bosnia and Herzegovina from the book Women Heroines from 1967. Mm -hmm. And the music is a famous German fascist song that slowly changes into the anti-fascist song from Yugoslavia and changes back. Okay. So basically the work is created as a kind of political statement about this part of women's history in Yugoslavia and how do we relate to it today in the countries of former Yugoslavia. Dankeschön. Das erstmal als ersten Input. Vielen Dank, Adela. Many thanks. This was the first input to Adela. And I would now like to give the floor to Adela, that will, Irina, that will help us with the moderation of the coming guests. All right. Now I would like to welcome Marta Havrishko for her to hold a short presentation and maybe to give you a few words for the context before Marta starts uh, speaking. What we will be talking about today, this is the mixture or the contraposition of the tabulation of uh, what women really have lived through and uh, the heroic myth. Their silence is usually due to this tension, this tension field, how we have uh, heard already in the previous hour. And now I would like you uh, to start with your presentation, Marta Havrishko. Are you there? presentation yes okay thank you very much so i will start my presentation as historian Raoul hilberg agued the road to, to annihilation was marked by events that specifically affected men as men and women as women both sexes were subjected to similar forms of persecution and violence abuse forced labor starvation deportation humiliation and death but only women had to cope with pregnancy, menstruation, abortions, invasive gynecological examinations. Despite the fact that some Jewish men also um, uh, suffered from different forms of sexual violence, the main rape victims were and survivors were women. The wartime Ukraine could serve as focus and lens through so which question of sexual victimization and sexual agency of Jewish women and girls during the Shoah could be studied. Sexual assault occurred in different locations, in Jewish houses, in the streets, in hiding places, in killing sites. In hundreds of ghettos and camps in occupied Ukraine during the Second World War, Jewish women were particularly vulnerable to various forms of sexual humiliation and abuse. My presentation is focused actually on the sexual violence perpetrated in these localities, in ghettos and camps. And I will highlight the role, the role of different perpetrators in this violence, include, including Ukrainian Nazi helpers. So uh, members of Ukraine auxiliary police, uh, guards, uh, members of um, uh, administration of camps and ghettos. As historian Raul uh, Regina Milhoiser pointed out, hair shaving, forced undressing, and gentle in, uh, inspection during the Shoah produced feelings and meaning in women that differed from those of men due to the socialized gendered roles and expectations. Those acts threat threatened women's men's security rather than being associated with sexuality and sexual humiliation. During those routine procedures in camps and ghettos, women suffered not only from men's unpleasant scrutiny, but also from the fact that men were touching their breast and genital. Some bodily search for valuables were overt acts of sexual violence. There were, uh, were also cases of sexual, uh, sexualized violence perpetrated with the aim of punishing women for certain um, uh, wrongdoings and intimidating others. For example, one of the Holocaust survivors of Yanovska camp in Lviv uh, recalled that a member of camp leadership forced Jewish newcomer to strip in order to take their possessions. One of the young Jewish women refused to do so. 
For disobedience, he forced her to lift her skirt from behind and then shot her in genitals. He called up a Jewish man and ordered him to cart her around the square until she died. In some ghettos and camps, women went through forced abortions, sterilizations, medical experiments, and could, that uh, these forms of violence could be considered as uh, genocidal, uh, genocidal violence. One of the widespread forms of sexual violence was rape. In many cases, it went hand in hand with looting of Jewish properties. In such cases, rape was a method of terror and torture to intimidate women and find out the location of valuables or the tool of punishment of the, um, if the offenders failed to get what they came for. Such rapes often took place in Jewish homes or next to them, them uh, with the women's family presence. Here, actually, you see on uh, the screen, you see the quote from the testimony of one Jewish survivor of Shumska, uh, Shum's ghetto in the um, Ternopil Oblast, one of the western part of Ukraine. And he described very explicitly how one of the policemen actually perpetrated uh, anti-Jewish violence. Uh, also, there were rapes taking place independently of looting. Germans and their collaborators raped women in barracks in their homes or workplaces. To hide the crime, they would often kill the women afterwards. And uh, many facts of this we can find regarding Bogdanov Bogdanovka concentration camp in the Odessa Oblast in Ukraine. Also, gun rape was not a rare phenomenon during the Holocaust. Groups of perpetrators would, uh, uh, would break into barracks and Jewish house and rape young women and girls. And here you see from this quote of testimony of uh, uh, Clara that uh, she, uh, uh, she know, knows about different cases when child, uh, uh, when children, Jewish children were sexually abused by Germans and their collaborators. Some girls and young women were chosen specifically for sexual abuse. Selection would take place in barracks and train yards during recruitment after the women came from the work or before deportation. Vera actually Shetnikova, survivor of Stepan Ghetto in Rivnesko Oblast, remembers, quote, at night, policemen would bring Germans and they would grab young women and rape them. They really brutalized them. They took the women away and then brought them back and left them half dead. Some of those who did come back after the rape uh, died from the injuries or committed suicides. Not, not all women uh, returned after the some period of sexual exploitation. Some of them were killed immediately after the rape, and some were killed after they contracted the venal diseases or uh, got pregnant. Leadership of ghetto and camps, as well as guards, often took advantage of their position of power and coerced women and girls into sex in exchange for food, medicine, and protection from deportation on the threat of killing the women themselves or their loved ones. Here you see the uh, quote of the testimony of one of the survivors of uh, uh, ghetto in, Kam in Kamenskudilsk, Clara. Uh, this is a quote from her testimony to uh, Soviet agencies, to Soviet bodies, and she uh, very explicitly described the situation when one of policemen forced, uh, she, ex uh, she underlined it, hung hungry women to agree to have sex with him. And she listed during this investigation several names of, of very young Jewish girls who were forced to prostitute themselves in order to survive. And um, uh, some men from camp leadership would hire young girls as house servants, forcing them, them to provide sexual services. At the time, some women perceived their body as an important survival tool, resource to save them and their relatives. Such women could initiate sex in their uh, oven with powerful men, which Myrna Goldberg called sex for survival. And uh, here you see the, the photos of uh, um, one of the Holocaust survivors, uh, Galina Klotzman, uh, pre-war photo and post-war photo, actually, when he um, did narrate his story. And she, uh, uh, she 
explained that uh, she knew some woman, a Jewish woman from the camp in Antonivka in Kivsk Oblast. Uh, and uh, this woman actually prostitutes uh, herself in order to survive. And she actually escaped from ghetto um, uh, uh, by this tool, by, by using her body. And my last point, um, it's very important uh, for us not only study the suffering of women and to describe how they remember, how they were traumatized and uh, uh, by sexual violence, how they recall these members, uh, what were the effects of sexual violence on them and their immediate family members or other Jews, but also to, to trace the Motivation, the motivations for sexual violence. And in different cases, this motivation was uh, um, uh, very uh, complicated and it, it's, not, um, uh, it's not easy to trace specific motives in any case. But the most uh, obvious for me motives were, were ideological and, poli uh, and political. I mean Russian uh, theory, I mean anti-Semitism, anti-Bolshevism, uh, the whole circumstances when uh, Nazi rule was implied in Ukraine, war factor when men were very far from their homes, and uh, so they uh, perceived all cruelties of, uh, of war, and um, uh, those cruelties, uh, when they observe, uh, observed them and participated in them, so they used to, to commit violence, including sexual violence. And military culture, as we know from feminist scholarship, uh, some forms of sexual violence, especially gun rape, could be a tool of building of military brotherhood. The presence of alcohol, drugs, and uh, pornography also played a crucial role in, in, many, in, in many sexual violent uh, behaviors. Also, social cultural factors, misogyny, and uh, uh, personal motivations. And my last... Awesome. Yes, yes, thank you very much. And uh, I want to, to stress, and some I want to stress that uh, we should study all examples of sexual violence in order to understand how sexual violence in uh, war become an instrument of not only a byproduct of war, but war itself and the instrument of war and instrument and uh, a tool of genocide. Thank you very much. Danke schön, uh, uh, danke. Uh, danke, Martha. Das war sehr interessant. Uh, 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 und ich habe eine, darf ich eine Nachfrage stellen? Thank you. Thank you very much, Martha. This was very interesting. May I ask a question in terms of the sources? Are these files that uh, have become accessible to you now in this uh, new situation with the Ukrainian archives? Uh, I'm moved. Yes, no. Everything. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, actually, uh, we have a range of sources regarding sexual violence in Ukraine. And uh, for me, as a historian, the most powerful sources actually are um, rape survivors' testimonies. Because they are very touching, let's say, they were very vividly describe their painful, traumatic experience. And uh, many women, um, many women bear the story for stories for uh, for decades, and uh, um, and um, due to different projects, they we could hear and now their voices about their experiences. Also, we should consider the you know, voices of Jewish men because uh, uh, they could describe some circumstances of sexual violence uh, when no one from rape victims we have, uh, no one survived, actually. So they describe many, many situations. And also, I, uh, I should stress that very valuable sources are actually KGB files, uh, because they contain a very, uh, I mean, post-war trials, they contain a, a lot in, uh, of information, especially on local perpetrators of uh, sexual violence and other sources, um, yes. We should consider every, every, every sources that 
connected to to Jewish daily, uh, women daily experience during the Holocaust? My, my Frage war nicht zufällig, weil my question was not um, coincidental because we interviewed hundreds of women and only two of them admitted that they themselves were raped. And they just made side remarks. I'm talking about women from the Soviet sphere, from Ukraine, Belarus, or Russia. So these were actually usually stories about the others, but uh, only very rarely did these women tell stories about themselves. This is why I asked you, because this is a very important aspect. Uh, thank you, Marta, uh, and thank you, Irina. We will uh, continue in order to finish our presentation round. Marta just uh, talked about sexual violence, and this will also be part of the next presentation. It always, it's always about how we remember and if we remember. And Robert Sommer will talk about a topic that has been ignored completely for quite a long time by historians. And I'm also looking forward particularly to his talk. He will also have a PowerPoint presentation in order to um, explain this topic, broth in uh, concentration camps. Can I be heard? Okay, great, thank you. The topic that I would like to talk about today is a little bit difficult because it's a very complex topic and it's difficult to describe it in brief, but I will try my best. I have prepared a short presentation and let me try to find out how it works. Share my screen, okay. Can you see my screen? I assume not yet. I think I have to uh, share my screen first. Yes, exactly, down in your taskbar, you should share your screen and then we can see it. Is this to see? Can you see it now? No, not yet. Now it works. Yeah. Also, ich spreche. Is this to see? Can you see it? Hello. Hello. Oh. Will you hear? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, but we see you several oh, oh. times, but not the PowerPoint das presentation, so unfortunately. <laughs> well, ich probier's mal noch mal. then this is wrong. I will oh, give it another oh. try. If it, so. ah, there it is. Okay, great. Okay, ich, äh, genau, ich habe das jetzt äh, in Englisch gemacht. Ich hoffe, das ist besser oh, zu, zu sehen. Dann. Uh, okay, ähm, das, it, uh, wenn wir uns an die nationalsozialistischen so Konzentrationslager erinnern, äh, denken wir zumeist an die Leichenberge, an die Krematorien von Auschwitz und ähm, an das unvorstellbare Massenmord der Nazis. Ähm, allerdings ähm, gibt es eben auch eine andere Seite der Konzentrationslager. Äh, die Lager waren ähm, seit Anfang oder seit Mitte der 30er Jahre und ganz speziell seit äh, Anfang der 40er Jahre und beginning of the 1940s were very important production sites for in den Lagern sollten die Häftlinge halt nicht nur gequält oder getötet werden, sondern auch in Fabriken arbeiten und das effizient Für die SS war das eine wichtige Einnahmequelle. So it was an important source of income for the SS. The problem, however, was that the productivity of the inmates was quite low because they suffered hunger in the situation. Das Arbeiten in den Fabriken viel zu viel Energie kostete und das ging natürlich Essen the work cost so much energy and the hatte dadurch eine Idee und so the SS had an idea in den großen Lagern in für Häftlinge Anreize geschaffen for, uh, in the big, uh, und diese Anreize camps, waren they, um, für die um, wanted to create some incentives for the higher food rations aber es waren eben auch relatives outside of the camps but also uh, uh, visiting the uh, was considered a special privilege for a bonus for special work performance in the Lagen hatten, because if you imagine, the, uh, das Überleben statt im Vordergrund, 
Uh, the prisoners uh, and their uh, intention of uh, in food was much more important, but not um, uh, um, visiting a brothel. However, the SS since 1942, uh, they built these brothels in the big camps, and these were brothels in particular for male uh, prisoners. Um, the SS was banned from uh, going there, and this is a picture of a uh, of the former brothel in Buchenwald. Women Prisoners oder aus Auschwitz-Birkenau wurden selektiert, Auschwitz äh, teilweise auch mit falschen uh, Versprechungen ähm, und in diese Bordelle gebracht. Uh, die allermeiste Zahl der Frauen brothels, waren deutsche Frauen. Um, es gab auch einige sowjetische Frauen und polnische Frauen. Um, und der Grund, weshalb uh, German, uh, zumeist deutsche Frauen in diesen Bordellen waren, war, dass auch zumeist deutsche Häftlinge in diesen Bordellen waren. Wir müssen uns vorstellen, dass in den Konzentrationslagern jüdische Häftlinge in den Bordellen waren. Die meisten waren entweder in Ghettos untergebracht oder wurden in Vernichtungslager gebracht und nicht ermordet. Die Häftlinge in den Lagern waren polnischer Herkunft, waren deutsche Herkunft, waren polnischer Or Czech or Soviet uh, origin in the or Soviet prisoners um, of war. Uh, many of them in these besuchten. camps um, um, keine, uh, uh, were the inmates uh, that uh, uh, visited the brothels were not Jewish uh, uh, inmates or Soviet inmates, but uh, German uh, Frauen, uh, inmates. For And, and this is why they chose German women to uh, work at these brothels. However, most inmates who und das ist auch eine Although der Gründe, the that were das heißt, to visit das Thema nach dem Krieg minority. unwahrscheinlich stark tabuisiert wurde. And this is why this topic um, nach dem Krieg was, um, gab es eine Zeit, really wo zunächst uh, über das Thema gesprochen wurde. Um, there was a certain period of time when people discussed this topic after the war, but then soon uh, there was silence. Uh, and the silence started because uh, many haben, of those women über sexuelle Gewalt sprechen können, realized that they... Auch could not Sie talk about sexual violence or um, they might also be considered as Union collaborators uh, von in particular from the point of view uh, of the Soviet uh, Union or others uh, that they aber noch viel would be stigmatized war, by other former inmates in uh, but Bordellen, viele what was more important is that in these process there were more uh, um, were Frauen, predominantly women who were considered asocial und diese Frauen haben nach dem Krieg keine Entschädigung bekommen und das trifft sowohl zu für die Bundesrepublik Deutschland also Westdeutschland als auch für äh, die ehemalige DDR. For the former, ähm, dort nämlich, ähm, und das haben nicht Germany nur bereits die deutschen German Nachkriegsstaaten entschieden, as well. sondern das haben bereits schon die Alliierten entschieden, ähm, wo nur Häftlinge entschädigt, äh, so only und those äh, rehabilitiert, die sogenannte politische Häftlinge waren, die who aus were political prisoners oder eben aus were Gründen, äh, der Religion verfolgt wurden. Based on their uh, und die ethnicity or religion and the so-called social misfits were excluded from it. And this um, was applicable to many women who were there. So this means that the women were never allowed to consider themselves victims. And this policy actually continued up until this year. What happened? Also ab den 90er Jahren versucht haben verschiedene Organisationen, sich einzusetzen für die Frauen, dafür zu kämpfen, dass sogenannte asoziale Frauen oder auch überhaupt asoziale Häftlinge nach dem Krieg rehabilitiert werden. Das aber ist allerdings passiert erst in diesem Jahr. Denn um, ähm, es gab in diesem Jahr im Bundestag ein Gesetz year, this year, und dieses Gesetz ähm, erlaubt es zum ersten Mal, dass diese Opfer, das Opfer, das die vergessenen Opfer der KZN, the, the ähm, entschädigt werden oder zumindest rehabilitiert werden äh, und als diese Opfer auch verstanden werden. Und, äh, und das war für uns eine, äh, der lange Kampf hatte endlich einen Sinn, nämlich oder hatte einen Erfolg gehabt. Äh, das this Problem ist eben nur, fight, dass die Opfer der, der sogenannten Lagerbordelle ähm, fast alle verstorben sind, höchstwahrscheinlich alle Unfortunately, verstorben sind. All die Zahl der Frauen, und die Zahl der Frauen, had died in between. Ähm, die, Zahl der Frauen die in den Lagerbordellen waren, äh, waren in äh, ungefähr 200 Frauen Brothels insgesamt. Ähm, man muss verstehen, es gab 10 dieser Bordelle und in diesen Bordellen waren viele Frauen äh, and die gesamte Zeit des Bestehens eines Lagerbordells äh, und somit so um die Zahl von ungefähr 200, 210, so 220 Frauen waren in den Lagerbordells. Wir können heute anhand der Frauen, die der SS sehr, sehr gut auch die Frauen benennen mit Namen, können auch ihre Haftgründe, ihre Herkunft, ihr Alter sehen und deswegen ist sozusagen trotz des Tabus, was lange auf dem Thema lag, ist die Opfergruppe der Frauen, die in diesen Lagerbordellen arbeiten mussten, sehr, sehr gut dokumentiert. 
women who had to work in these brothels as well documented and um, even better than most other victims. I would like to show you a few pictures at the end. I already showed you the back from the outside and here we can see a picture of um, the room where the woman had to stay over the night. We see flowers and also the picture of a German shepherd uh, on the wall which is supposed to reflect um, a nice um, home. However, the reality of the woman there was this room, uh, the brothel room, so at the uh, end of the day also these women were inmates. Here there's another picture. This is a so-called bonus uh, sheet the official uh, currency in the camps and the Modell male inmates could uh, buy the access to the and, uh, for themselves. Um, this is one rice mark at the beginning, later on two rice uh, marks. Mark. This is actually the uh, price for the, uh, the um, prostitution in the streets uh, at the time. And there was also the so Sie mussten um Erlaubnis bitten Another piece und äh, solch einen sozusagen paper, so the inmates had to äh, ask for, for access, access um, sagen, and go through an administrative um, procedure in order to be allowed access to these brothels. Um, There's also also pictures of these women. Um, I'm a little bit hesitant to show uh, these pictures because I don't want um, to the become certain faces, faces uh, uh, to become representations of sexual violence, but on the other hand, I do also think that it's very important um, that we understand who we are talking about. We are talking about women, we are talking about human beings. I mean, these are just three women, we have more. I chose them because the first one is a Russian woman, the second one from Poland, and the third one from Germany. And the women in these pictures did not know what would happen to them. These pictures were taken from them, of them when they were brought to Auschwitz. At the time, they did not know what would happen to them several months later that they would be chosen to work in a brothel. These women survived as most women worked in the concentration camp brothels. And uh, this brings me to the end, and I think I'm running out of time as well. Um, just a few words on the description. So for many years, this was an absolute taboo in um, history research, also in the memorial sites. Um, since rehabilitation, most memorial sites have actually reviewed their exhibitions, and nowadays we have exhibitions on this topic. This is an exhibition at the Forum of Women's Book, Women's Concentration and it's very important. Um, it's an exhibition Mittlerweile ist das Thema auch Teil der Ausstellung. Und was ganz wichtig ist, ist, dass keine Bilder von Frauen gezeigt werden. Und es immer wieder die Bilder von Frauen auch verwendet werden, stigmatisiert werden, wenn Frauen, weil sie auch von sexueller Gewalt sind. Und dieses Thema auch durch verschiedene sensationalistische Medien wie Filme immer wieder sozusagen hochgekocht wird. Und das wird halt den Frauen nicht gerecht. Und das ist nicht justice to the woman. Thank you, Robert, for this very interesting introduction. Just on the procedure, later on, we will have the opportunity, or our guests will have the opportunity to raise questions to the panelists. But now I have a question from uh, a lady from the audience. She asks you, Robert, how about the social misfits <coughs> And this term, can you explain this further? Mm. It's very important to better understand it. So thank you. Um, the so-called social misfits were in, uh, inmates in that uh, they were, let me speak in English or German? German. Uh, no, it's German. German. They were like, socially marginalized, uh, so those inmates were made prisons because they didn't show up for work, because women had too many children, because the father used to drink heavily, but uh, women have been uh, Born to the barracks, being social misfits because they were accused. Prostitution was not forbidden during the Nazi regime, but what was forbidden was um, prostitution in the streets. And so the, the prostitutes had to register in order to be able to work in brothels and had to undergo physical examination twice a week. Should she not accept, then she was arrested, and the third time she would end up in a concentration camp. So the NS tried to find and recruit women that already were prostitutes for the camp brothels, and many women were already uh, sterilized beforehand because they were prostitutes. 
Could you briefly specify what the Kaufmann asked? What kind of crimes uh, also, were they arrested also for? Das wissen wir nicht ganz genau, weil sozusagen wir wissen, dass sie als sogenannte not really known. They we know that they Fällen, have been arrested being um, social also misfits, but only in a few cases. We know that one woman uh, tried um, to not show up at work anymore and uh, tried to avoid the controls and one of the prostitutes did not want to undergo registration in order to work independently like a freelancer, but we may not forget that um, the only ability for women to live independently was tuition back then. So many women decided for this direction. This is how they ended up in the concentration camp. Thank you so much. This is something we will look into later on. I would now like to hand over to Irina, who would like to present our fourth panelist with her presentation. Thank you so much for this handing over. And uh, now we would uh, like to transition to violence in the broader sense. Now we were talking about the enemy imposed violence on women. And Aida Papikian talks about uh, injustice, violence against their own women in the own country, women that uh, have been made political victims uh, during the war in Armenia. Aida, are you there? Wir sehen noch gar nichts. Okay. Yeah. We can so, see anything yet? Yes, there is. My presentation will be about the repressed women uh, in Armenia during the Second World War. Uh, the, um, my research is based on two main sources, the electronic database uh, of victims of Soviet repressions in Armenia and the cases of uh, repressed. So uh, to show uh, the peculiarities of uh, women's repressions during the Second World War, I've created a graph presenting the dynamics of arrests of the repressed uh, people uh, by gender based on the years of arrests and the uh, years of decisions on arrests. Uh, as the flow chart shows, uh, similar to other Soviet republics, in uh, Soviet Armenia, far greater uh, proportion of men than women were subject to uh, repressions uh, throughout Stalin's period. The dynamics of repressions for both genders partially re reflect the same picture. Um, three peaks uh, in case of men and two in case of women. However, uh, it is obvious from the graph that men's uh, repressions were at their height during the Great Terror, whereas the uh, number of repressed women uh, hit the peak during the Second World War. Uh, 794 uh, women were repressed from uh, 1941 to 1945 in Soviet Armenia, constituting 66% of total uh, number of repressed females throughout Soviet period, um, uh, which was approximately 1,200. Uh, this can be partially explained by the conscription of men into the Red Army, uh, Lubov Tinisova, in her book called uh, Rural Women in the Soviet Union and Post-Soviet Russia, uh, mentions that the proportion of women in the Gulag rose from 7% in 1941 to 26% by 1944. Uh, Melanie Illich, referring to Frierson and Vilensky's Children of Gulag, uh, classifies uh, two types of victims of terror, uh, the direct victims who were repressed and the indirect one, uh, usually uh, the family members of uh, members of violated families who were not repressed, but 
suffer the consequences uh, through social discrimination or the deprivation of public privileges. Uh, however, in terms of uh, women, this classification can, cannot always be applied, uh, even if they were repressed. Uh, they should be considered mostly as indirect victims, uh, despite uh, the types of accusations. Uh, so you can see on the screen the types of accusations uh, during uh, the World War. Uh, they were women were charged uh, with carrying out anti-Soviet or fascist agitation, creating false documents spreading or circulating rumors, fleeing from work or camps, spying for being members of a family uh, of traders to the motherland, deserters, wives, and bandits, wives, or sisters. These uh, last three groups uh, group, uh, did not commit a crime against the Soviet state, but were the members of criminals' families and were considered subject to repressions. Uh, I like to focus on uh, two of these uh, types. Uh, family members of traders to the motherland were, were the largest group uh, uh, during the Second World War, making up uh, 598 uh, females. Only 308 of them were exiled and 290 were freed uh, immediately or were granted early release. Uh, they, uh, the imprisoned women were exiled for five years with their children uh, to uh, southern and northern Kazakhstan, to Novosibirsk, uh, and to northern regions in general. Uh, and 93 women, uh, which was the second largest group, uh, was, were charged with agitation and spreading rumors, while during the pre-war years, only 21 out of uh, 126 were convicted on the same ground. So uh, this seems to suggest that the war situation has simply contributed uh, for more arrests of women on the above mentioned grounds. A glance at the charges may suggest that the, this group of women were imprisoned because of their crimes, but examination of cases show other circumstances uh, for, that could be uh, the actual reason for arrest. One of these women, um, was accused of spreading rumors and panic, but uh, the case reveals that her house had been searched with the connection with the uh, denunciation about a uh, smell of pork fat. According to the witness, uh, the father of the accused woman worked in bakery where all these rare products for wartime had come from. Mm -hmm. uh, in the yeah. second case, uh, my time is out. Yeah, good. <laughs> Uh, okay, just to conclude in two uh, sentences, uh, in the studied case, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, the war theme uh, seems uh, artificial. Yeah, Sie können Aida noch ein bisschen, yeah. Uh, you will be given just a little bit more time, yeah. artificially connected with the charges and uh, uh, this war situation have o has often been used as, a, uh, as an opportunity and not the reason for repressions. And also uh, here in the observed cases, the women have been uh, considered target for repressions. Regardless the type of accusation, in almost all cases, women have been arrested in connection with their husbands, fathers, and brothers, which allows to claim that they have mostly been indirect victims. This is all. Thank you. Dankeschön, Aida. Ich würde nur ganz gerne eine Ankündigung Thank machen. you so much, Aida. I would just uh, like to make a short announcement uh, for those who are interested uh, to raise questions uh, to the audience. You are allowed to raise your questions. You find it down at the bottom, task line and Q&A. We are receiving the first questions and now we have half an hour left in order to discuss. Uh, Irina, do you have any question to Aida in particular? No, thank you. Okay, so then before we start off with the discussion, I would like to 
to ask uh, every single one of the panelists. We had an interesting question in the first panel. We are moving now between different role images. This is what we formulate already. And uh, the introduction, of course, uh, the victim is an important role or the role of the partisan woman that was mentioned by Adela just in the beginning. So it is more like a heroine figure. And in the panel, we raised the interesting question is beyond that, we might have had alternative narratives, those who might have thought about alternatives to war like uh, pacifist movements or pacifist options. So beyond the narrative of being a victim or a heroine, can you contribute to that idea just briefly, if you have anything to contribute from your own context? I thought this was an interesting question. It goes a bit beyond that. Are there any ideas, Marta, Ida, Robert, Adela? Maybe you come up with anything in former Yugoslavia. Were there any women we have heard from our colleague from Belgrade? Robert, okay, your turn. Um, yes, um, the nar narrative in Germany, in both Germanys, Eastern and Western Germany, was pretty much dominated by political prisoners. Uh, prisoners who were uh, um, arrested for other reasons, like homosexuals. Um, anti-social people or um, um, uh, so-called criminals uh, did not have a voice. And this was the case in both Germany's East and West at the same time. And again, you know, as this year's things changed because now, now they are also accepted as victims. But for instance, homosexuals also had to fight for a very, very long time to be accepted. Um, and just remember, I mean, for that uh, until the 70s, uh, homosexuality was still illegal in many of European countries, and especially East and West Germany as well. Um, and uh, so the narrative was dominated by these political prisoners and very often as, was very um, a heroic narrative. Um, and the heroic narrative um, is we, we try, we historians in Germany try to find also narratives from other people. Um, the number of people, for instance, so-called antisocials or criminals uh, who actually managed to talk about it was very, very small. Um, and it was really started in the 1990s that um, um, in particular, uh, historians try to find their voices, but um, we try to include it now. We um, in the memorial of Ravensbrück, uh, those uh, forgotten victims are pretty much represented, um, and also they were giving a voice. So, I feel like two sentences. That's okay. Maybe just briefly, two sentences. The, uh, uh, um, uh, the, the denial of war, pacifism. This was a movement that broke out moreover after the war and massively. And in the, uh, in the Soviet language, it was not as widespread uh, talked about the civil pacifist movement and war never again. And then for propaganda purposes, this could be used. From the Communist Party, this was taken up because the war, even if you came out of the war as a, a winner, you have been uh, you, you've been perceived, the whole thing has been perceived as a tragedy, as never again. And uh, this uh, turned out uh, to be a, 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 a sentence after the war. Everything except the war. So this came out of uh, the attitude of people coming out of the war. And uh, women, especially the women, was uh, were the ones who were bearing this thought in mind. Thank you so much, Irina. And once again to the audience, we are receiving many questions. Uh, you are free to raise your hand uh, down on the uh, task line. You can see uh, this possibility to raise your hand. We have Elena. Ah, please go ahead. You have to demute yourself and then you can raise your question. Hello. I would like to welcome and greet everyone. I'm very happy that this uh, meeting came about. A question to Aida. 
Uh, this topic is very interesting. We started our session uh, with uh, with arts. Uh, we kind of were introduced through art. Do we have similar examples in Armenia as well? Because we don't know that much about this region, whether there are these uh, approaches through art to understand the past topic. Thank you very much for your question. I will answer in Russian. It is very difficult to uh, speak about media and arts because the media is only used in order to speak about the deportation of the Armenians, but also not too often. Uh, the topic is somehow displaced and um, not very... Uh, pressing, it's not very widely discussed in the um, Armenian society, but there is a woman who was the wife of an Armenian writer uh, that was also subject to repressions along with her husband. They were exiled and her memory, uh, memoirs remained. Uh, she wrote her memoirs about uh, also this part of her biography of her life, and this is ver a very important and in interesting source. Thank you very much. Many thanks for the question. I have Gagi now. Thank you very much. My question with uh, to goes to my distinguished colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, Zomer, with regards to women in war and their role, and I mean the watch women in camps, the watchers, uh, Hildegard Neumann, for example, Helma Grese, uh, others, because we know also these biographies, their violence and brutality was beyond any moral conceptions and standards. And I think in a way, to some extent, them too are war victims, victims of war. Because you uh, spoke about everyday life in camps and concentration camps. And I was wondering, uh, are there any, is there any research on these women as well? And also, apart from Nazi ideology, maybe there were other conditions, uh, social, socio-cultural conditions that created these monsters and made these women such monsters. Robert, you can answer the question. We have Irma Grese, we have um, uh, Ilse Koch, um, those women who are known as these cruel or blonde beasts. Um, and we know this because, because uh, we, know, we, know, we know them because uh, of testimonies they gave or, 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 or coverage of, of trials where they were tried. And we know also from testimonies of prisoners uh, of their incredible uh, uh, um, behavior of, uh, of their cruelty, which is uh, really unbelievable. But there's also another side of, um, of women who were working at the concentration camp. Um, I very often say that um, the border between good and bad was not among the, um, between the guards and the prisoners. We had uh, also guards who helped prisoners, as well as we had the cruelest guards you can ever imagine. Um, so there were also women um, working at concentration camps who uh, tried to have a safe income, who tried to um, have kind of see this as a regular job, um, we know of women who worked at the camps mostly because of the trials. So we know of the um, of of cruel monsters uh, mainly because of that, of the coverage. Um, there's but there's another stratum. As men as there uh, as much as there's also men, uh, there's also women, um, the so-called normal guards. Mm -hmm. um, in testimonies, you will see um, that you know you have we have to differentiate. And um, I'd like to invite you. Um, there's a lot of research done at the Memorial of Ravensbrück on the subject. Um, they just open up a new exhibition uh, about, especially about guards, and it's really interesting to see the complexity of the subject. So I'm sorry I cannot give you a simple answer, but as we see, you know, um, good and bad people, um, there's a whole big range of motivations of people actually who to serve as guards. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. It's very uh, difficult. 
to give a brief answer on such a complex topic. Thank you, Robert. We have another question from Mrs. Pito. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, the presentations and I would like to connect them to the main theme of the conference uh, because in the introductory uh, discussion, uh, it was mentioned that the purpose of the conference is to find alternative stories and alternative narratives. And uh, this topic, uh, Women in War has been discussed in the past 30 years, and it really came up with these stereotypes as women as warriors, women as martyrs, uh, women as nurses. Uh, so the question is, where do these stories come from? Because if uh, in this panel, at least, we had uh, some discussion of these sources historians and artists are using, but the sources you will be using, Aida and Robert and Marta, they were the perpetrator documents and they were presenting them as the true documents. In the previous session, we had the oral history testimonies and they were presented as the true stories. And I was just wondering, where do you think these new stories will be coming from? And how can we, as I say, get rid of this uh, pretty empty stereotype that women were silenced and their stories were not being told? Thank you. Briefly to Marta, maybe you can give a brief answer. We still have three questions or comments from the audience. Okay. Thank you very much, Andrea, uh, for this question. I think, yes, the most uh, stories of sexual violence um, came from oral testimonies, first of all. Uh, as you know, as many historians who deal with this topic know, but actually, um, recently, I'm working very closely on uh, post-war um, uh, Soviet war crimes trials. And there are a lot of, a lot of Jewish survivors' testimonies about sexual violence. And I found many cases about specific localities in Ukraine, which describe sexual cruelty of many people involved uh, in anti-Jewish violence, especially at the beginning of World War II, especially when it comes to those who are perceived as national heroes in Ukraine, uh, those who later joined Ukraine a nationalist, a nationalistic movement. Also about uh, sexual cruelty and uh, uh, brutality with, with sexual manifestation, um, uh, which was perpetrated by uh, neighbors, non-Jewish neighbors of uh, Jewish women. So I think that uh, close analysis of these specific sources could give us a broader perspective we can learn about different cases of sexual violence. We can learn about different motivations and uh, about very complex uh, picture because uh, we have a story when some when some perpetrators who commit sexual violence ex actually uh, nowadays are uh, perceived as, uh, as, uh, as aid givers uh, to Jews. They hide some Jews. Uh, also, we have a story. Um, also, we have to, to rethink the agency regarding the sexual violence, especially when, uh, when it comes to uh, forced prostitution. So uh, I, I'm talking from, from my perspective. I'm dealing with these specific um, sources. And also, I, I want to stress that um, by myself, I re uh, conducted um, uh, several dozens of interviews of non-Jewish um, witnesses of World War II, especially in Western Ukraine. And they talk a lot about sexual violence and, and about their position of bystanders in, in these cases. And uh, many of those stories are unknown to us. So I think we, we have a lot to to investigate and a lot to answers to be, uh, a lot to questions to be answered. 
Thank you. Uh, if, if I can come just a follow up, ah, that, that, that's, that's very fine that you have got all these documents. But, uh, you know, looking at these uh, sources, when Jewish men are talking about Jewish women uh, to the KGB uh, uh, investigators, I would not consider as the authentic sources, which you can actually use one by one to prove your claim. I just want to flag these methodological issues using perpetrator documents. Thank you. Yes. Yes, thank you very much uh, of this comment. Yes, it's uh, very valuable. Um, actually, we we should get every sources with, yeah, with, okay, critically, let's thank say. You. Thank you very much, Marta. This was a very important um, uh, view on the perpetrator's perspective. Uh, here we have a brief request before we let the other participants from the audience raise a question. I think Adela wanted to say something. Adela? We have 10 minutes left. Adela, do you want to uh, reply to this? So please uh, turn on your mic. Well, well, it was at one point in the middle of some of the questions and I just wanted to add, it was a question of martyrs and herrings. And um, what I wanted to add is that, for example, in this, uh, book of uh, women herons of Bosnia and Herzegovina for me problem problem was um big problem is that these women are represented uh, as such like super powerful and uh their their stories of their suffering like what for example they're like singing while they're uh, uh wounded and being carried through the woods or they're digging their own graves and basically singing, they're jumping in, in, in their own graves before they've been shot. And such stories about these martyrs were mostly named national heroines after their death were actually a little bit problematic because, you know, we had 100,000 women fighting in, in, in Yugoslavia in directly at the battlefield. And it is, I think, today and after the war, of course, was and in these books and through the stories, was hard for ordinary women to identify with such, you know, superpowers of some, you know, and, and suffering stories. But actually, it is the truth that most of these women were coming from rural areas. There was 100,000 of them, and it should be easier to identify with because they were all heroines in a way, you know. So this was just to answer this question between the heroines and you know, is there any 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 narrative in between? Thank you very much, Adela. This was once again the Yugoslav perspective. And now I've got two questions. HP, I'm not sure what your name is, the lady with the curled hair. Maybe you can briefly introduce yourself and then say your name. Hello, everybody. My name is Hayarpi Papikian. I am really very thankful for this opportunity to participate into this uh, webinar, and it's a privilege given in these conditions of COVID-19. So thank you very much. I have two brief questions. My first question I prepared for Adela Justik. I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> oh, by the way, I'm sorry. I'm historian. And, um, my question to Adela Yustik is, uh, thank you very much. I really adored your video. Is it available publicly? And if it, is it possible to share? And the number two is, did you ever have the chance to kind of promote it towards the municipal council or any kind of authorities? Because nowadays what I observe uh, the memory of World War II is become highly politically charged question. So the question of being remembered or remember people who participated, it's not much of like gendered question by but current geopolitical questions. These are based on my observations on the mm, memory celebrations of the last May the 9th. Um, so, and the second question, I'll briefly ask my questions and after that, let our panelists answer them. And my second question would go to Aida Papikian. Um, uh, I was really very fascinated about the findings of her research. And I would like to know if there is uh, this kind of information available to understand or whether these women were convicted or sent to gulags based on neighbor denunciations, or these were still state organized uh, um, arrests like it was the case with their families. 
And uh, a small uh, question, which has Armenian specifics. Uh, are there any Dashnak relatives uh, or also former? Two questions, can I just ask two quick questions? Adela and Aida, just quickly. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, uh, just shortly. So basically there is a, a, a this video is described and the whole project, this illegal action is described on my WordPress, which is my first and the last name WordPress, and it will be probably uplo uh, uploaded uh, this evening for the whole conference for everybody who didn't see it for, so the day tomorrow can see it again. And the second question was, uh, yeah, well, basically, uh, we de I decided not to notify any municipalities or anybody else. In the end, it's illegal, any legal action. So. At the time, I was working with the Association for Culture and Art, Servena. So basically, if, if the, the organization Red would be punished for placing the monument, it would cost a lot of money. And also, me personally, as an artist, would have to also, in this illegal action, pay uh, pay the penalty for placing it in, in the center of Sarajevo in such historical uh, uh, surrounding. So we des I decided to stay silent in in a sense of these local authorities and to see what's ha what happens. Uh, how do we? What does anybody notice the monument? The, the monument. I mean, the monument. The gravestone, the, the the tomb, you know, and by now nobody did. And three years, it's over there, and it, it is wonderful because now it's almost natural there in the grass, and it looks like it belongs there, and it's look like a real, real grave now. And um, I've been though talking about it, then exhibiting uh, documentations about it, and uh, uh, giving some lectures around the region and and Europe in many different international exhibitions that were questioning this subject. I hope I answered both. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Adela, the link to the film can be shared later on. Is, is that correct? Okay. Yeah, we will, we will make it possible to see it for tomorrow. Okay, last question to Aida, and then uh, I think we have to conclude. Just uh, a brief answer, a, a concluding remark. Okay, thank you for your question, hi RP. Um, I will say that uh, although it is difficult to differentiate whether the conviction were, uh, convictions were from uh, because of denunciation or uh, regulated by the state, but uh, in the cases of the repressed people, uh, in particular, uh, uh, in particular in cases of uh, regarding the agitation and uh, spread of rumors, there, there were facts about the denunciation of co-workers, neighbors, uh, and uh, etc. So uh, in some cases you can re really see these facts about uh, denunciation. Yeah, wunderbar. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Irina. Many thanks, uh, Irina. Maybe just one last question. Okay, before we switch over to Walter, who has uh, the final word, and Walter in Berlin, I would like to comment on something, just a few sentences. The reason why we have chosen women to be our focus today because of course many have uh, men have been victims of war crimes as well but it is important to highlight once again that the war and of course the many gulags uh, here we wanted to talk about the war mainly if even a war of defense and existential war is dehumanizing the people. It is violence on a daily basis. It is dirt and dust and therefore, and the women, because of physiological can reasons, um, of course they have been a lot more effective, uh, affected. They have been part of the Red Army, in uh, the Holocaust, this of course goes beyond every human imagination that um, during these strange times, uh, these highly violent times, uh, the worst thing is that they've received violence from their own ranks. And this is uh, why I asked the question about the partisan women, because all of a sudden, 
the war that is so cruel that dehumanizes the people and then all of a sudden we see women more as objects and women that are fighting side by side with you and therefore it is a very terrible discrepancy in partisan women and for those who have uh, participated in war Alexeyevich that should be mentioned just briefly um, we always say that the war does not have a female face but uh, the, uh, the women are found in the tension field between the heroines that they are supposed to be and what they really have lived through and that they've suffered from their own men they, are, they were fighting side by side with. Violence from perpetrators. This is uh, very difficult to explain humanly, but it's at least to be understood in this uh, relationship in this context but when we experience violence uh, as women there's a pure violence from men that are supposed to be our, our shield our protective shield this is uh, truly very dehumanizing and um, the consequences of this dehumanization of the violence and everything those women live through and the men that uh, came back with those experiences to normal life and uh, then we have to imagine those generations in Poland, in Russia, in the Soviet Union, in Germany, all those uh, men that uh, came back that did not have any psychological treatment. Um, of course, uh, this violence and uh, uh, this aggressiveness had an impact on their families and we live we live in a society where we still have to uh, live through or have to bear with the sequelae from all these war crimes um, so therefore i do think it has been rightly chosen to talk about the women today many thanks for those different perspectives today and now we switch over to walter in berlin how are you hello Thank you so much uh, to this uh, wonderful panel, to um, you know, uh, Marion and Irina. Walter Kaufmann is my name. I'm the head of uh, the Southeastern and Eastern Europe Department from the Heinrich Böll Foundation. I have to admit that I am moved and impressed by all we've had today. The, uh, Opening up taboos really is quite energy intensive and it will take a few generations more in order to conceal what's been hidden for many, many, many years. And uh, what I found really interesting in the discussion is uh, that, uh, that stories are affected by the marginalization by taboos that shed some light on the active and passive role that women conducted. Though uh, the uh, active fighters, the partisan women in Yugoslavia, women being victims, uh, victims of sexual violence, so different kinds of violence. Um, those women usually don't play an important role in our history books. And then I thought it was interesting to listen about uh, alternative narratives. If we find anything beyond the dichotomy um, between the victims and uh, the heroines, where well, are those women um, that resisted the uh, reality that had to subsist and I think there are a lot of stories that are yet to be told. And what I really like to see that we were able to talk with more than 150 people in different countries and not once I had the feeling that uh, we would not understand another one another because uh, we come from different countries. But I do think that we achieved a common understanding about our late history. And I would like to seize the opportunity here in the last minutes to ask you, maybe there are two or three of you who would like to take up uh, the microphone and to tell us what uh, 
you liked, what could be done better. Maybe we have two or three people with a short feedback um, to listen to. And for the others, uh, I would like to ask you to use the Q&A option, not for technical issues, but uh, if you would like to provide us with some positive or negative feedback, what can we do better in the future? Are there any comments or recommendations? Do we see any hands raised? Or oh, short comment? Yes, I raised my hand again. I think, uh, yeah, it's marvelous what you've done here. I think it is important that we shed some light on the narrative as the victim and the perpetrator. And I would like to see women empowered to talk about their experiences and uh, consequently talk about the why. Why are we doing this? Why are we giving and providing those testimonies? Because we would like to have a peaceful future. And I think this should be put in the, in, in the center of attention. Thank you so much. Uh, Mrs. van Boven, her name, right? The next I can see Elena Shampova, a very well-known face from Moscow. Over to you. Thank you very much. I also would confirm that uh, this difficult form of work has succeeded, and I'm very happy about this. We shouldn't forget it. We shouldn't uh, go too much into it with too much excitement and replace our personal meetings with that. But this opportunity with people from 35 countries, um, it's probably impossible at the moment uh, to create such a personal meeting. That was the first point. And the second one, I think it was very important that we somehow have mentioned many directions for future talks. This is very good. And this leaves me with a very good impression. Thank you very much. Are there any further comments? I think I see a few tired faces already. We've covered three hours, more than three hours here in our Zoom meeting. We all know how demanding this is uh, to simply look at the screen for such a long time, but I have to admit that I'm not really as tired because uh, I was really inspired by all your inputs. I've seen interesting faces with interesting contributions. And I would like to thank you all for being here, for participating. This has been, of course, a huge experiment here for us. Uh, we were highly nervous uh, to hold this conference that uh, we uh, usually hold annually on a presential basis. Now shift this to the internet and hold an online meeting, the new technology we are using here. I hope that uh, this has been an insightful experiment for you as well. We have been more than 270 participants at the most here. This, of course, is reason for us to rejoice. Thank you so much to the interpreters uh, that this worked out this well. And then as a representative of uh, the whole technical team and organizing team. To